So I was just kidding about my excitement being about football this morning. I'm really excited about this. In fact, uh, I want to demonstrate that excitement this morning, if you guys will allow me again, right? right. No. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't know who cleaned that up last week, but thank you very much. I had all intents and purpose of doing that. Whenever I make a mess, I want to clean it up, but somebody cleaned it up for me. So, um, yep, rewards in heaven. That's all I'm saying. Thank you for doing that. So, uh, but we are in 1 Corinthians 15 as we're con continuing our study through this chapter. We've obviously we've going all the way through the book of 1 Corinthians and we've made it this far. But we're in 1 Corinthians 15, and and uh, for those uh, who are wondering. Yes, this is part five of That's the Gospel Truth. So here we go. Yeah. I'm not being real creative on sermon titles right now, but uh, it, just, it just fits. It fits uh, all these things that we've been talking about uh, here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And um, I will tell you right now off the bat, there is a difficult verse in this section, verse 29, the very first one uh, that we're actually, when we get into the passage, we're going to discuss. But that's okay, right? We're okay with difficult things in the Bible. What we're going to do is we're going to do our best uh, this morning, and I'm going to do my best to, to uh, explain that verse to us that we can get a good understanding uh, of it. But before we get there, I uh, wanted for us to have this thought in the forefront of our minds as we go through the rest of this chapter. You guys know what I mean by the forefront of your mind? Like right here. Actually, right there. Right there. In the forefront. So like this is the filter by which we're going to uh, take these verses in today, okay? When I say that, all, all doctrine, all theology, the truth of Scripture, if you will, is not meant to merely be discussed. Oh, thank you. We got one, we got one in here This this listen. Can I repeat? Let me repeat that. All doctrine, all theology, the truth of Scripture, if you will, is not meant to merely be discussed. Amen. That's right. The truth of Scripture is giving to bring about a practical response. I, I, again, I, we preach here to make better worshipers. Right? Amen. Quality disciple. Man. <laughs> Where's that confetti kid in, man? <laughs> <coughs> That's what this is all about. So when, when, and that happens as we hear the words of God and apply it to our lives with action. Amen. That's how that takes place. We live it out. We hear the truth uh, of God's word and we live it out. I, I do want to put this quote up by uh, John MacArthur this morning to help us with that. This is what he says. He says, Scripture is never intended to be theory. It is always intended to have a practical incentive built into it. Right doctrine leads to right behavior. Right principle leads to right conduct. That's the way the Bible goes. God lays out certain truth and he expects certain kinds of behavior in response to that. And uh, I just thought he would say that better than me. So that's why I quoted him today. The, so I want to illustrate this. So we're going we're gonna to deviate a little bit from 1 Corinthians just so I can illustrate this point before we get there. So we're, the book of Romans gives us a great illustration of this. Uh, the first of like 11 chapters of Romans is like theology. It's theology on top of theology on top of theology. And then you get to this uh, verse in chapter 12, verse 1, and this is what Paul says. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So he's like, in light of all these other things that I've said up until this point, this is your response, is that you give yourself wholly to God based on this theology. Let's look at some of that theology that he, that he lists out in, in the uh, first 11 chapters of Romans. We're just going to look at, we're not going to look at all of that, right? We don't have time for that. But we're going to look at chapter 6, so Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 14. And you guys just listen to this. 
and see what I'm talking about, this response that, that, that truth should bring out in us. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, Paul tells the Romans, he says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. That's the kind of theology that produces a response in God's people from those who have benefited from that theology. It doesn't make us sit in a quiet place in quiet reverence in church. It makes us want to shout this kind of truth, this kind of theology. And that's the whole point. God's word is never meant to just be listened to like a lecture. It is meant to be responded to with passion and with action. That's why it's delivered. Again, this, sort, this kind of truth requires some sort of response from us towards God. The writer, the writer of Psalms puts it this way. You guys are familiar with the book of Psalms, all the, all the praises, all the God. This is who you are. You are worthy, all of these things. And the psalmist does this in, in, in Psalm 116, 12. He says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? He's like, what should my response be to God because of all these great things he has done? And for this great being that he is, what should be my response? You know, I'll tell you, the, the truth of that is, is that our response to God is usually uh, tied, or it's usually to the degree that God has benefited us. Or what we think he has benefited us anyway. So if we have little response, we think we have a bad view of God because we think he's benefited us little. But we have a great response that shows our gratefulness to God and what he has done for us. Let's look at, let's look at Luke, the book of Luke, to just to understand what I'm saying. And I know this is the introduction. But I'm telling you, this has got to be in the forefront of our minds before we get to the rest of these passages here in 1 Corinthians. But let's look at the, at the book of Luke, chapter 7. And this is G, because so, so, so this is Jesus, uh, and, and, uh, and so him, him and uh, Peter are having this discussion, okay? And this is what Jesus says to him in Luke, chapter 7, verses 40 through 43. He says, and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher, right? Wouldn't we be the same way if Jesus said, hey, I got something to tell you. Okay, say it. Say it. I, I want to know. I want to know. He says, say it, teacher. And so he says it. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 so a denarius was a, 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 day's, a day's wages, okay? So we have one person who owed him 500 days wages and somebody who owed him 50 days wages, okay? So that's the situation that we're at. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him 
more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, from whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus, and he said to him, you have judged rightly. You have judged rightly. Now, that's just talking about what I, the, this point that I'm trying to make. It, it, once you and I realize just how much God has done for us, just how much he has forgiven us, Amen. right? When we realize that, that produces a response from us to God. So again, I, uh, uh, amazing grace. Listen, you guys are familiar. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's the fact of understanding that we are wretches that makes grace so amazing. Do you guys get where I'm coming? Do you guys get what I'm, I'm laying down here? Yeah? You tracking? Right? Yeah? Okay, good. The more of a wretch that you and I understand we are, the more amazing the grace is and the sweeter it sounds. Some of us have forgotten what all God has done for us. Some of us are in disagreement with God about what he has allowed. He allowed something in our life that we disagree with, and, but we forget about all the other stuff that he's done. But, 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 but this one thing, God, you didn't do this one thing. And we're allowing that to hinder our worship to him. But he's, but he's worthy, right? He's worthy. Has he done great things for you? Yes. Can we all say with passion, amazing grace, how sweet the sound? Yes, we can. And, and we cannot forget that uh, as we are responding to him. You see, the, the truth of God is God reached down and pulled each of us out of the muck and the total uh, destruction of our sins and forgave us and gave us eternal life. Not to mention, he was betrayed and beaten with an inch of his life. He suffered, he died, was buried, and rose again so that you and I can participate with him in the resurrection. Is that enough to produce action from us? Is it enough? Is it enough for us to respond appropriately to what God's truth tells us? Come on, church. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's get to those verses in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to look at verse, starting with verse 29. Starting with verse 29. And this is, what it, um, this is what it says. It says, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Anybody a little bit bewildered by that verse, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the raising the hands in the back. Yeah, this is bad theology, right? This, uh, this doesn't fit the gospel. It doesn't fit what you and I know. We know that this, is, that this can't be. We can't do this. We can't be baptized on behalf of someone else, okay? And so I, what, I, uh, what I would like to do is, is like just talk about what does it mean to be baptized on behalf of the dead here? And I'm going to tell you, there are about 40 different views. Probably there are more, but like 40 different like maybes that this, that this uh, particular scripture could mean. And so what I would like to do in addressing this, uh, I would like to talk about what it is not first, okay? So I want to talk about what it is not, and then I want to talk about just two other possibilities, all right, um, of the meaning of, of this verse that the Bible does support, okay? Because the, the rest of the Bible does not support how you and I are reading it. 
right now. Okay, there's it's no, found nowhere else uh, in the Bible. Okay, so now we're practicing good uh, study of the Bible right now. Okay, that's what we're doing. So, um, so first, what it is not. So, some take this verse to mean what you and I initially read and thought it would mean as proxy baptism. Do you know what it means by proxy? You ever heard, you kind of hear that in elections, you vote by proxy, right? It doesn't work in our nation and it won't work for baptism either. <laughs> but that's what, the, that's what some have taken this scripture to mean at, on the surface, is that it just means it's proxy baptism. It's where a believer is baptized on behalf of a dead relative. I think there was uh, some of that sold back in, in early to finish building a, a cathedral somewhere. But anyway, um, but we find so much, we, we find no such teaching in the New Testament that that, that can happen, that that is a, something that people do. <coughs> in, the, in the second century, there were some heretical groups that practiced vicarious baptism, so that's another word for this, vicarious baptism, but the church at large has never accepted this uh, practice uh, because, again, it, it goes against uh, the gospel. Bas baptism also, I would like to point this out, baptism for the dead is an important part of Mormonism, um, if you guys weren't familiar with that. And... Um, and obviously, we don't agree there either. Uh, but again, the, but the Bible gives no support to the idea that anyone can be saved apart from personal faith in Christ. Okay? So to begin with, salvation is a personal matter that each must decide for himself. And second, nobody needs to be baptized to be saved. And again, we know this. We know this. And we know that there's no such thing as proxy baptism. So, now, <clears throat> whether Paul is a, it would just seem weird that Paul would mention it, that they were, they were doing this bad practice, right, and not correct it specifically. And so that's why we think that there, this doesn't, it just doesn't fit, all right? So we, we sort of have this problem, like, sometimes that we have, and this is why it's good to to, it's good to read your Bible, but at some point you're going to have to begin to study your Bible, okay? Because you're going to, you'll find things like this, and this requires study. It requires to get it to the, to the bottom of what's happening. And so what we have here is sometimes because the English language, and I've mentioned this before in our message, is that the English language is sometimes insufficient, especially when it comes to interpreting the Bible. All right, what we have. Now, uh, again, but I'm all for that. I know that God protects his word. I know that too, okay? So, again, uh, I'm going to address that as we, as we move through here. But I just wanted to say that up front. So, I think that what we have here is that we have um, a little bit of a translation issue. So, for the – now I'm going to just talk about the two meanings that Paul could be describing here. One – that we have to understand is that the Greek word huper, that's the Greek word that's being translated here on behalf of or for, okay, that's the word that's being transferred, but that, trans, that word can be translated many different ways. It's translated here on behalf of, but it could also be translated for, over, above, across, beyond, instead of, in the name of, because of, so because of the dead, uh, in reference to the dead, with regard to the dead. So it could be translated in all those different kinds of ways, all right, into the English language. So because that there were some uh, who interpret this passage to mean that because of that, there are some who interpret this passage to mean that people were coming to Christ and being baptized in order to see their loved ones who have passed away, again, at the resurrection. Now, you and I are familiar with that sort of concept, right? We hear it at funerals. We hear it uh, preached that, hey, hey, you know, guess what? We get to be reunited with these loved ones at the resurrection, right? We get to be reunited with them, these ones that have 
passed away. And so that's one of the ideas that Paul, Paul is like saying, so, um, so, be, so he's saying that why are you being baptized because of or in reference to or with regard to the dead if there's no resurrection? That makes no sense. That, that, that's the whole point that Paul's trying to make. You're doing this practice, but yet there are some of you who say it's no resurrection. So why are you doing this practice if there's no resurrection? It'd be the same for us. Why are we coming to Christ? And why are we being baptized to, to, to publicly demonstrate that if there's no resurrection? Why are we going through that? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, another uh, interpretation uh, is this. The other meaning is simply that Paul was referring to their own physical bodies that are going to die when he says on behalf of. Why are you being baptized on behalf of your dead body, right? If there's no resurrection because our bodies will be, our physical bodies will be resurrected, right, at that time. So it's like why are you going through uh, this ceremony uh, why are you physically being baptized in order to demonstrate being resurrected with Christ if there's no resurrection? Again, it doesn't make sense. Okay? Now, you can choose either one of those, or if you find one you like better, you can choose it because it's really a non-essential. Right? Right? We're just doing our best. It's really a non-essential. What is essential, though, is that there is a resurrection. And that's the whole point that Paul is trying to make. Is that there is one. This, there's an actual resurrection. Um, in fact, one of the main points of baptism is to point out the resurrection. Again, referring back to Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And we will be raised from the dead. Just like Christ, there will be a resurrection. So baptism is directly related to the demonstration of an individual salvation that leads to the resurrection. And we can't be baptized for the dead. That was a decision for them. And we can't make that decision for them. They have to make uh, that decision. That, that is also why we don't have infant Baptism, because they can't decide anything, right? It, it, again, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit with the gospel. You were baptized to demonstrate your salvation. You, you're accepting to choose and follow Christ when he drawed you to salvation. And nor do we pray anyone out of purgatory because it doesn't exist, except back behind them worship center here in that little hallway. I'm kidding. That's an inside joke. That's what we call that hallway because it doesn't go anywhere. It's, it doesn't lead anywhere. So we call it, we nicknamed it purgatory. But, anyway. but do you understand the concept? It's the same kind of concept. You can't be on the behalf of others. It's salvation is an individual thing. So is baptism. Warren Wiersbe uh, has this quote that I wanted to share with us at this, at this moment. And this is, this is what this scenario should do for us. He, he, he says that this, he says, each responsible person on earth will share in either the resurrection of life and go to heaven or the resurrection of judgment and go to hell. That's in John 5, 28, 29. We weep for believers who have died, but we ought also to weep for unbelievers who still have the opportunity to be saved. The reality of the resurrection is a motivation for evangelism. So instead of trying to be baptized on behalf of, let's just get out and share the gospel. That's what needs to take place. All right, let's move to verse 30 and 32. And Paul says this again. Speaking about if, they, if, you, if there was no resurrection, he, he's like, why are we in danger every hour? I protest my brothers by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. He's like, I promise you, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts in Ephesus? If the dead are not raised... Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 
That last little quote there, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die, is found. Uh, he's quoting the book of Isaiah, chapter 22, verse 13. And, and basically what Paul is saying is if there's no resurrection, then what we do with our bodies have, will have no bearing on our future. That's what he's saying. But that's not true. <laughs> what we do in the body in this life comes up for review at the final judgment seat of Christ. We read about that in 2 Corinthians 5.10. But Paul tells the same group in, a, in another letter. He says, for we must all. How many? All. all. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Does it matter what we do with this physical body? It matters. It matters. Paul is uh, also asking the question, if there is no uh, future for the body, then why suffer and die for the cause of Christ? Which we know that Paul did end up dying for that. We know that most of the apostles ended up dying for Christ, giving their life uh, for him. So if, if that's the case, then why do that if there's no resurrection? If it's not true? then why go to those lengths? But it is. But there is a resurrection, and the suffering endured in the body will result in glory at the resurrection. That's what we are promised, and that's what Paul is discussing here. Let's look at, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. And this is what he says to them. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our what? In our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. I believe, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Is there a resurrection? Yes. And does it matter what we do with our bodies because of that? Yes. All of it matters. It's important. Does it matter how we respond to the truth of God's word? Yes, it matters. It matters. So what suffering did Paul have? Because he talks about this, right? He goes like, <coughs> Paul's like, I die daily. Which there's two parts to that, right? Because we, we, we die daily to Christ, right? We, we give up ourselves for him daily. So if Paul is talking about that. But, th but that dying daily to Christ for Paul was leading him to have life and death things all the time. He was in danger of dying every moment of his ministry. Every moment, every day. He woke up knowing that his life could be taken from him because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when he says I die daily, he mean, he literally he literally he means it like like I die to Christ daily, and because of that I do these things, and because I do these things I 
am, am in chance of dying daily. Like, it's a, it's, a, it's a for real thing. So let's look at some of those things that Paul suffered when he talks about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 through 28. Just, this is just a quick list. <laughs> Five times, he says, I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times, excuse me, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger uh, at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul's like, why would I do all that if there's no resurrection? I would be an idiot, right? I would be an idiot. And by the way, when I would just encourage us to pull that list up in our suffering, to be encouraged by Paul. All right, verse 33, 34, Paul gives us some really good advice here. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God and I say this to your shame. So Paul he comes out with this great quote, bad company ruins good morals. Anybody parents ever tell you that? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 It's in the Bible, so it's true. Right? It's in the Bible, so it's true. You know, Paul, Paul this is an interesting fact real quick. Paul is actually quoting a Greek poet when he says this. But it doesn't make it any less true, right? But he's quoting a, a Greek poet named uh, Menander uh, when he says that particular quote, bad company ruins good morals. I love what Tony Evans had to say about this verse. He says, he says you cannot make unbelievers your constant, intimate companions and think you will escape unscathed. Cozying up to heretical teachings and lifestyles is dangerous. Thus, Paul tells the Corinthian believers, point blank, come to your senses and stop sinning. Right? Oh, and I know some people right off the bat, they're like, oh, but Jesus hung out with all the... Jesus didn't live their lifestyle with them. Jesus made himself available to them. Jesus was there not to leave them in that situation or circumstance. And he definitely wasn't joining them in their sin. Right? This is the thing. This is what you and I have to be careful of. But see, the issue, the, so the issue is not being around them. The issue is, is doing as they do. That's the issue. And how many of us if we were to talk about our life up to this point, have fallen into that. Right? All of us, all of us have done something stupid because of the people that we hang around with. Mainly men. If you're a man, I know that that's happened to you. <laughs> right? Men are always doing something stupid. It's part of manhood, right? Yeah, nearly cutting your finger off with a pocket knife, stuff like that. Right? My wife's just shaking her head. I told you not to do that. Right? Very practical advice. This is what was going on. Immorality was a way of life in Corinth. And I think that you and I would agree that our world is that way too. Immorality is a way of life. And some of the believers 
And I know that you and I can, can, can attest to this too. Some of the believers rejected the resurrection in order to rationalize their sin. It's kind of like those people that you and I know that who are hyper grace people, right? They're hyper grace in order to rationalize their sin. Like, oh, I'm under grace. I can live however you want to. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I do in this mortal body. I, I think we've proven that wrong this morning, right? It does matter. It does matter. Because we're under grace, it matters. Because the, what, we, what we do, this whole idea of, of our response to God's word, we're not trying to earn anything from him. He's already given it to us. Right? We're not trying to work our way. You see, that's when it becomes wrong. That's when it becomes legalistic. That's when it becomes all these things. But no, but when it's the response because of what God has done in our life, that is the picture of the gospel. That's exactly what should happen. When we read about baptism in, in Romans chapter 6, we are raised to walk the old life, right? No, we are raised to walk a new life. So, Corinthians said, the old is gone, the new has come. And so Paul's like, why, why are you hanging out with the old? Why are you trying to, to, to do the old customs that, 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 that the, these Greeks, they don't believe in the resurrection. Why are you turning to that? You know there's a resurrection. That's part of the reason why you came to Christ. So some believers reject the resurrection order will rationalize their sin, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure this is our problem. But I think that we easily forget about eternity. And we focus on the here and now. And that rationalizes our sin. I do think that. First John chapter three, John really addresses this and I, I wanna be really careful here to explain exactly what it means because you and I, we're, we're not going to live this Christian life perfectly, right? But we are to put an effort to that, right? We are to, but we're not. And so when I read these passages from 1 John, I want you to, to hear them from, from the truth of what John is saying. When he, when he says, doesn't go on sinning, he's talking about lifestyles. He's talking about lifestyles of sin. Okay? So when I read these passages, I just want to make sure that we're clear there. But this is what he says. 1 John chapter 3, 4 through 10. He says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning, you guys understand it. What he's talking about, a practice of sinning. This is a lifestyle. This is something that I'm doing. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared, talking about Jesus, in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning either has seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he and as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Devil. Is, is John being very clear? Yes, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. Because he has been born of God. But this is evident. This, but this, by this, sorry, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. It should be very easy for us to tell the difference between good and evil. And in a world that you and I live in who are trying to blur those lines all the time, 
But it's because we have the seed of God in us that we are to be able to tell the difference. And so what I'm telling you is, is if you're hanging out with people who are not demonstrating righteousness and y'all are living life, a lifestyle together, Paul is telling you, stop doing that. Because they need Christ and they need to understand the resurrection. And you're not helping In that, in that situation. To fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness is only to corrupt God's temple. And you guys know that we are the temple of God. Ephesians 5, 6 through 17. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God has come on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Any questions? No. There's no questions. There's no questions. So we church, we who compromise with sin, we have no witness to the loss around us. And Paul is saying it is a shame for us to be selfishly living in sin while multitudes die without Christ. That's why he says it's, it's a, to, to, to that it's your shame. It's your shame that you're doing that. I know that the ladies have been discussing the positive part of shame. And this is it. It's a shame that produces a response to God. So because there is a resurrection, it is time for us to wake up, church. And that's what Paul, that's what, that's what he says. That's what he says in these last verses. Wake up from your drunken stupor. Get your minds right. Remember the truth. Focus here. Last passage for this morning as we close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <coughs> verses 1 through 11 talking about this he says now concerning the times and the seasons brothers you have no need to have anything written to you for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night when will, it, when will the resurrection happen like a thief in the night that's what's going to happen it will come like a thief in the night while people are saying there is peace and security then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers. You are not in darkness. For that day to, uh, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor are we of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Guys, the truth of God's word 
should stir up a response in us to him based on these things. The truth about the resurrection, that there's going to be a resurrection, should drive us to be evangelists. That's what it should do. And so this morning, we, we've heard, like, I wore my daughter out with all these Bible passages, by the way, up in the booth. But we've been handed a lot of truth today. A lot of truth from God's word. And so what has that done? What is, should that do? That should stir up some response. So church, what response does the truth of the resurrection get from us? As a body of believers here, what response does that truth get from us? I just want us just for a moment to respond to God based on the truth that we've heard today. We'll do that now.